God is shaking the earth. But the question is, do you see it? Do you see it? God shakes our lives so that we, we can consider who He is. The question is, are your eyes open to what He's doing? He shakes our marriages, He shakes our finances so that we're able to, to, to see what God is actually doing. The question is, do you see it? The question is, where is God shaking your life right now? Where has God been shaking your life right now? What is He trying to get you to see? For me, it's me being able to see my need for help. Not being able to say, hey, I've got it, I've got it put together every single time. But to actually see my need for help, to see my need from help from my wife, help from my leaders, even this morning helping build it, helping in setting up church this morning. I still need help. It doesn't matter where you get to, what position you have, you always need help. But God is helping me. He's shaking my life up to help me to see my need for him. But the question is, what's God been teaching you this week? What God, what has God been teaching you? You know, God is shaking up our pride, our insecurities, our selfishness, our worldliness or religiosity, all these different things God is trying to shake up out of us. God is doing this so that his house, his church will be filled with his glory. Point number one, open your eyes. Open your eyes, Matthew chapter nine. In Matthew chapter nine, you know, sometimes we're oblivious at the fact that God is shaking up the world and we need to open up our eyes. I want to challenge the North region to stop playing peekaboo with the world, to stop closing your eyes to the, to, the, to the hurts and the harassments that we're seeing in the world, but to actually open your eyes. Point number one, open your eyes. Matthew chapter nine, in verse 35, the Bible says, it says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. You see, the Bible had teaches that Jesus went through the towns and villages. He didn't avoid one stop. It's like getting on the Edgeware line or the Northern line rather, and he stopped at every single stop. He would stop at Collindale, get off, preach the word. He'll stop at Burnt Oak, get off, preach the word. He'll stop at Hendon Central and stop at every single spot. Not just the spots that he so desired. He didn't just want to stop at Tottenham Court Road because it was nice to see. Because, you know, the shops are there and, and it's, it's nice and glittery and sparkly. But he stopped at the places where they needed help. It said that he opened his eyes and he saw the harassed and helpless. He saw them being stabbed. And he said that he was, he was filled with compassion. He was moved internally in the Greek. Moved internally, he was stirred up. He was filled with compassion. He was filled with compassion. Seeing the women being harassed and helpless, filled with compassion, the single moms, filled with compassion. The broken marriages, filled with compassion. The abandoned kids, filled with compassion. I believe when Jesus saw us before we, be, we became disciples, he was filled with compassion. Yeah. I remember my life when I wasn't a disciple. Uh -huh. Every single day, I was nearly stabbed three times. Amen. Three times I was nearly stabbed. And I was not even in a gang. I was not even in a gang. But guess what? My friends were. My friends were. And I believe some people, some of those that, are, that get stabbed, they might not even be affiliated to any gang but they're just in bad company. And the Bible teaches that we are to be the one that draws them out, those bad companies, and preach the good news to them. I was, I was, I was and then he got stabbed three times. Was held at, gun, at gunpoint one time, outside my house, outside my house. And I believe that God looked at me and he had compassion. I remember praying those, three, those four times where, I, had a, where, I, had, where I, was, I was genuinely scared. And I was like, God, if you're there, please help me. Help me. And I believe God heard that prayer. I would not be alive if it wasn't for God. The question is, do you believe that about yourselves? Do you have compassion for the, for the lost? Do you have compassion for the lost? When you see the world, what do you see? What do you see when you see the world? The Bible said he looked at them. He looked at them. He took time 
just to have a look. You know, sometimes we struggle when we look. And that's just because we've not been with God. We struggle and we're like, no, nah, I can't do it anymore. I'm going to walk away. But the Bible says he looked at them and he had compassion. The first step is to open your eyes. Open your eyes and see how lost the world is. Everyone is not actually happy, believe that or not. We've all done the Bible study. We've all done Psalms 119. And we thought we were happy, right? Yeah. We had the money, we had the cars, we had the relationships, whatever it is that you had, you thought you were flat fired up and nothing could change your, nothing could change your mind. Yeah. Until the Bible was actually preached to you. Yeah. Then your minds were open. Yeah. Then your eyes were open. Yeah. And you actually saw on, that there's nothing in this world. Sure. You actually saw that those relationships were fake. Uh -huh. That you weren't actually a man. On, you didn't know how to lead a woman. You actually saw that, man, those, 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 the, the, the finances that I find my security in was actually fake. And you saw your need for God. Yeah. I believe that God is calling us to preach the word yes. because the world needs God. Yeah. It says that he proclaimed the good news. The word for proclaim is not just to merely teach, it's to preach the word. To preach the word. To preach is to stab, if you guys didn't know. Yeah. It's to stab. When Peter was preaching the word, they were cut to the heart. And they said, brothers, what shall we do? I believe that if we do not preach the word and stab the demons, they're going to go out stabbing people in London. They're going to go out stabbing people in London. We got to preach the word. The question is, do you teach or do you just preach? Do you teach or do you preach? When you get into Bible studies and you share your faith, are you just teaching them? Are you just sharing your faith or are you actually sharing your faith? Are you teaching or preaching the word? How do you communicate the gospel? How do you communicate the gospel? You know, when he saw the, the crowd, he saw the harvest. The Bible says he had compassion. He had compassion. How many people have you shared your faith with this week? How many people have you shared your faith with this week? No evangelism, no, evangelism, no compassion. How many people have you followed up with this week? No follow up, no compassion. The question is, do you care? Do you care? The word for compassion is to be, to be moved inwardly, to be moved to your bowels. Like there's an inward disruption within you. There's an inward disruption. The state of the word, the, the, the state of the world disturbed, like literally disturbed Jesus Christ. Jesus looked at the world and he saw it was, it was just disturbed. That disturbed him. It disturbed him. He wasn't just comfortable living in a sinful place. He says, I got to do something about this. Some of the brothers, you live in burnt oak. Does it disturb you when you go to the station knowing that people die there? Or have you grown comfortable with the disruption that's going on around us? Question, are you disturbed or have you become insensitive? Becoming insensitive to the lostness of the world. Insensitive to the, to the humanity of, of, of the world right now. Jesus looked around and he saw the senselessness of the stabbings in London. And you know the answer? He chose you guys. He said that you are the hope. You are the hope in Burnt Oak. You are the hope in Dulles Hill. You are the hope in Tutbridge and Whetstone. You are the hope in North London. The Bible teaches that you are the hope. You're the light of the world. You know, becoming insensitive to the lostness of, the world, of this world is actually disturbing. Jesus looked around and he saw the 11 stabbings. Jesus had compassion on those men that were stabbed, but also the ones that were doing the stabbing. He saw, man, what, what drives you? What drives you to actually want to take someone else's life? What drives you to do such a thing? What drives you to want to have an abortion? Something must have died in you. You must have killed yourself to be able to go out and kill someone else. What drives you? The question is, have we died to ourselves? Have we died to ourselves? You know, all of these stabbings were done by men. They were all done by men. You know, there are issues caused by men. And the Bible teaches that men are also the solution. Men are the solution. I put before you that the men that are in here today, 
Disciples are not disciples or getting restored. You are the solution for this lost world. You are the solution for this lost world. And for those that have gone past discipleship and you know what it means to be a disciple, the Bible says that you are the solution. You need to become a disciple. Yes. Get baptized and start saving more souls. Oh, bro, bro. The crazy thing is that Jesus doesn't just have compassion for those men, but he also has compassion for us. He had compassion for you. He sees them as harassed and helpless. You know, in Luke chapter, in Luke chapter 23, verse 34, it says, whilst they were hurling insults at him, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. You think about the sins that you did in the world. You never knew what you were doing until you actually studied the Bible. Like you, you, you never knew your final destiny until you really studied the Bible to see how much hurt you're causing, not just for you, but future generations. And the Bible says that Jesus was pleading to God, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. Jesus sees the world as ignorant. But the question is, how would they know unless until they have someone to preach the word to them? How would they know until they have someone to preach the word to them? The cause, the, the, the solution for this world's ignorance is you. Is you being able to get up and preach the word every single day. If these men that are being harassed and helpless knew about what you knew, you know right now, do you think they're actually going to go out and stab people? Do you think they're going to want to commit divorces, commit abortions, rape, murder, all these different things? What we have is special. What we have is priceless indeed. What the world needs are workers. What the, what, the word, what the world needs are workers. You know, the Bible says in verse 37, it says, then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord for the harvest. No, ask the Lord of the harvest. It says it's plentiful already. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the field. The Bible teaches that the world needs workers. The world needs workers. God is shaking up the world so that the workers can go and get the harvest. The harvest is plentiful. There are people that want to study the Bible. There are people that want to become disciples. There are people that want to change. But the workers are few. You know, just last week, Stellian and I was going into a Bible study. And as I was about to go into to a Bible study, I, I meet this in, incredible man, blonde hair, an awesome dude, awesome looking dude. And I, I say, hey, do you want to study the Bible? He says, yes, I do. He was like, when can I do it? I, I said, when are you free? He says, I, I'm free right now. I want to study the Bible right now. I'm like, hey, I, I actually have two studies right now. I can't do it right now. Let's do it tomorrow. And he was like, okay, cool. Yeah, let's do it tomorrow. An hour later, Stellian also meets the same person. And he says, I want to start, and he gets gut level open about his sin. He says, I struggle with homosexuality. I, I, I heard the person that gave me your number is actually a friend of a friend, you know, and I heard that you, you, you overcame that and you now, you're now sold out Christian. How did you do it? And Stelian obviously helps him out. And then we meet up the next day. He comes in and he sits down and he speaks, he starts speaking in parables. And I'm like, what is this? And he's like sharing in, in metaphors and all these different things. And I'm like, bro, just cut to the chase. What sin are you in? What are you talking about? And he says, okay, guys, guys, I, I got to level with you. I, I just caught AIDS. I just, I've just caught AIDS and I've lost my hope. I've lost my hope. I've lost my hope. You know, there's been multiple times I've tried to take my life. I've lost my hope. And honestly, that's why I wanted to study the Bible. The day before, I was like, what can I pray for you for? He said, strength. Strength. Help me with strength. The Bible teaches that this world is lost. And they actually want what you have. Yeah. They want what you have. Don't desire what the world has. They want what you have. Again, we got to be workers in this lost world. In, in John chapter 4, in verse 38, it says, I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. God is looking for workers. He's continuously looking for workers. Why? Because he wants to build a great church. It takes a great worker to build a great church. God is looking for those not just willing to share their faith, but those that are willing to have compassion. Willing to have compassion. 
Jesus looked and he saw that there was much to do. And the answer is workers. I put before you the issue is not the harvesters. The one thing that we're missing is compassion. We have the workers. But the reason for, our, for why we do not work is because we lack compassion. Why? Because our eyes are not open. We need to open our eyes so that we can have compassion and then do the work. We need to have compassion. The Bible says, ask the Lord of the harvest. The Greek word for ask is to beg. To beg. To get down on your knees and to beg. To weep, to cry. To shed tears for the lost. When lost did you cry? Not for your, not for your interest. We need to stop having these kind of conversations. This is not like a, a place where you just come and date. We love people that date. I believe Michael and Claude, they have an awesome dates and relationship. We love that. But do you know why they have a special relationship? It's because all they're focused on is glorifying God and building the church. That's all I hear them talk about. You ask them, where, where, would, be a, where would you like to be? Where would be a great destination? They said the church. The church. You know, I believe that's not some of our hearts. Some of us would actually like to elope to Ibiza. Some of us, it, it is in the church. The church is a nightmare for some of you guys. But you think about the world. The world wants what you have. Your, your worst days in the kingdom. That is their dream. They dream for your worst days in the kingdom, for someone to disciple them, to correct them, to rebuke them. People pay thousands of pounds to have what you have, but you have it at your fingertips and yet we don't even use it. You don't even use it. Again, where would you like to be? Is it the church? If it's not the church, like Stelian preached, you wouldn't, you, if you don't love the kingdom, you're not going to give, you're not going to sacrifice. But again, we think about Jesus, he says, ask the Lord of the harvest. He says, you got to beg. We need to beg God for the lost. We need to beg God for those that are studying the Bible. When have you wept for those studying the Bible? Like cried, 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 not I'm struggling. No, cry for those that are actually struggling. When last have you cried? You see, when you beg, it means that you're desperate to see, a, to, to see something done. Yeah. You think about those that are on the streets begging. They're desperate for need. They're desperate for help. They're desperate, they got no shame. They got no shame. But some of us are too ashamed. We're too ashamed to actually beg God. And yet we, we put in our time, we put in our work, we put in our efforts, but we don't beg God because God sees our hearts and that's why he doesn't bless it. He's not just looking for workers. He's looking for workers that have compassion because the compassion is going to move you on the days where you don't want to work. You need a greater why. We need a greater why. It's not enough just, oh yeah, I want to be saved and I want to be a disciple. That's not enough. There are people lost. There are people lost. There are people in your family that are lost. But we need to be those that work. You know, you ask yourself the question, when was the last time you begged? Your answer will show you how much you actually care. It will show you how much you actually care. I believe... For some of us, we, we put in the work, but just so that we can get our disciples off of our backs. But we need to start putting into, in the work because we actually love people. Point number two, the world needs you. The world needs you. Matthew chapter 10. In Matthew 10 in verse one, it says, it says he called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every diseases and sicknesses. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These 12, Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. You know, the Bible here, teaches that Jesus, he tells them to ask the Lord of the harvest and, 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 and pray for the workers. And then he says, okay, you are the guys, are the workers. You guys are the workers. I'm going to send you guys out to go, to go do the work. So he's saying that you got to pray for yourself sometimes. You got to beg God for strength. 
You got to get beg God for strength. God, help me to help this woman. Help me. I don't know how to, to handle a single woman. I'm, I'm just a campus student. Give me the wisdom, God. Do we beg God? How are our prayers? How do we pray? How do we actually pray? Is it just religious stained glass windows prayers? Or is it like begging God? When was the last time you cried in your prayers? When was the last time you connected in your prayers? It says, ask the Lord. And then he sends the, he sends the disciples out. He says, I know you guys are just a bunch of teenagers, but you guys are going to change the world. Why? Because you've been with me. And that's it. You and God is all it takes. You and God is all it takes. You know, if there's one thing that, again, I keep lifting this dude up. You know, I've, I've given him a hard time over the years. I keep lifting up Michael Adrian. You know, I, I've, I've given him a hard time over the years. But, but, but if there's one thing that I saw and I'm like, bro, he finally gets it. He says, the only way I'm going to change the campus, I'm going to change the teens, is just my relationship with God. You know, I believe some of us are asking me, what do I do to change my Bible talk? What books should I read? Yes, read books. I love reading books. But that's not going to do it. It's you and God. Yes. It's you and God. Yeah. I believe it's time for the North region to get spiritual. Yes. To start believing in the power of Almighty God. Yes. You know, I, I love this park. I love this park. And you know, you think about work as I, I love to work. And sometimes it, 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 could, be a, it could be a fault of mine. But you think about it, like I, six years ago, we used to have park service. Yeah. And, uh, and Michael was just like, we high. And Mike, Michael called him out on, on stage and was like, yeah, this is my son, you know, whom I love and all that kind of stuff. And it was awesome. But like, I, we used to have park service here. And before Sunday service, I would work a night shift. And the night shift was like 10 minutes down the road. If you guys know, it's called Blue's Kitchen, just 10 minutes, 10 minutes away. And I would work a night shift from like 7 p.m. to like, like 6 a.m. in the morning. And then finish the night shift. And I'm like, if I go home, there's no point going home to come back to park service. It's going to be long. I have to hop over, the, fair, hop over, the, over the, the, the gate, come, have my quiet time here, sleep for like 30 minutes, join sung practice, and then start service and start worshiping God all over again. But again, the question is, why, why did I do that? I love God. I love God. I believe some of us, we, we, we get a little bit you know, resistant to pressure. You know, you, you, you get asked to, to even do food delegations or, or, or all these different things and you're like, oh man, I, I don't know. I'm like, what are, you, what are you talking about? What are you actually talking about? Do you actually love God? Why are you here? Why are you here? I, I want us to truly ask ourselves that question because I, I, don't, I don't want it to be a thing where you come here over and over again and then you, you, you actually end up getting embittered. There are people, I've seen that happen too many times in the kingdom. You come because you, you, you believe you're forced to come. And then you come and you come and you come. And over time, you, you get bitter and you fall away and you start writing persecution videos. I see that in some of you guys. If I should be honest with you. I see that in some of you guys. You're embittered. You don't actually love your discipleship. You don't love God. That's the, that's, the, that's the issue, is you don't love God. You need to love God. This is, this is the real deal. This is not no redeemed Christian church of God or, or CAC or Catholic, whatever it is. This is the real deal. We actually love Jesus Christ. We're not here to, you know, our, our, our preacher actually goes to charity shops. He doesn't buy private jets. He wears broken shoes and all that kind of stuff. That's the church that we go to. We believe in actually saving souls and not using the money to, 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 to kind of like, you know, use it for, for our glory. We want to glorify God. We want to invest in people. We want to invest in people. Do you love God? You know, the Bible is so clear. It's so clear. It says, I have given you authority. It says, do not go among the, 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 the people. It says he gave them authority. The word for authority in Greek is exousia, which is to have power over choice and to have influence. To have influence. If you are not influencing people to become disciples, you haven't been with Jesus. You haven't been with Jesus. 
or you don't actually believe the word of God. Those are the only two things. You don't actually, it's the, it's the same thing actually. You just don't believe in, you don't believe in the Bible. The Bible teaches that Jesus has given you authority. He has given you power. So your life is to be a life of impact. Your life is to be a life of influence. Who have you influenced this year? Who have you influenced to become a disciple? Who have you influenced to get out of the drug addiction? Who have you influenced to get out of the pornography? Who have you influenced to get out of these things that you see clearly? Or have you just been too scared? Some of us, we, we go through mental, mental we, we, we have this mental masturbation going on. Where we're overthinking, we're like, am I called? You know, am I, am I, do I even have authority? Who am I? It's not about you. Jesus says it's not about you. He says he's given you influence. He's given you authority. You say, should I start a Spanish ministry? Absolutely start a Spanish ministry. I say vamos to that. You know, I, I, I want to lift up Ruddy. Ronnie was like, on his own volition, he was like, we need something, we need some Spanish going on. I, amen for the Italians, amen for the Portuguese. What about the Spanish people? On, and what does Ronnie do? Without any advice, he's like, I love God, I'm going to go to South London. Amen, that's not my region. <laughs> and I, I, I felt a little bit some type of way about it. I'm like, okay, bro, you got you to do some work here as well, bro. But like, he goes out to the South region, shares his faith with James. James don't even speak Spanish. He, he shares his faith he gets six contacts and he says, hey guys, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna bring you guys to the north because that's just not, that's not what we're about. Hey, Dom, have these studies, have these, have these people, these guys wanna study the Bible. And that's just his heart. That's just his heart. You see, God is giving you the ability to have influence. You speak the languages you speak, not because of you. It's not because of you, it's because of God. You have the skills that you have, whether it be camera, media, social, whatever it is, not because of you, but because of God. Because of God. God wants you to build a great church. You see, if you don't believe that you've, you have influence, you're not going to do anything. Why? Because your mindset determines your behavior. Your mindset determines your behavior. How you think will affect how you, how you actually act. If you don't think you can't do it, guess what? You're not going to do it. If you think that you're actually going to do it, you're all going to do it. Yeah. You know, you have social media um, influencers nowadays. They don't even have the Holy Spirit. <laughs> but the principle oh, is universal. Yes, right. the, the, the principle of just believe is universal. If they believe that they're an influencer, they're going to influence people. They're going to, and they, they actually do. Yeah. And they influence some of us. Do you believe that you have more influence than those? Come on, bro. Do you actually believe that? If you don't, you're actually in sin. I'm just going to put it out there. I, I believe that, that some of our, our sins are not just this like, you know, Galatians chapter, chapter like it's not, it's, not, it's not that anymore. We're, we're kind of growing past that, which is good. But some of the sins is actually a lot. It's, it's just that unbelief. Yeah. Yeah. It is the worst. Unbelief. You don't believe that you're the son and daughter of God that you have influence to drive out demons? How dare you? Who do you, do you know who, do you know how God views you? Do you know how God views you? He says that you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. And then you want to think different. You're trying to tell God that, God, you're wrong. You know, there's a, there's, there's, a, there's a part in the Bible where it says that the call of God is irrefutable. Yeah. And Michael Adrian struggled with this, with this scripture for yeah. a long time. And I'm like, bro, like, the, the Bible says the call of God is irrefutable. Yeah. He's called you. The word for irrefutable is irrevocable, rather. Yeah. The Greek word is, is, um, is to cause to repent. That God, you cannot call God to repent. Yeah. Sometimes we are like, oh man, am I called? Am I even, do I have influence? You're saying that, God, you're wrong. You got to repent, God. Woo! No, you got to repent. You got to repent. We all need to repent and believe the good news. Believe is just a decision. Not influencing people to become disciples. The issue is not believing the scriptures. The issue is we're too prideful. You know, these tells, Jesus tells them to beg God for the, for the, for the workers. And God says, the answer is you. You know, in 1914, a famous advert circulated England with Lord Kitchener 
He was that. This is this. This is like the 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 the, the lieutenant for for the for for the, for the English army. Yeah. He was on the front cover saying, "Your country needs you. Yeah. Your country needs you." With you as a big uh, in in big letters, this poster was able to recruit over one million people to join the battle. Wow. To join the battle, as people felt indebted to the services of their country, and I put before you. That not Lord, Lord Kitchener is calling you today, but it's Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. He's calling you and he's also pointing at you. Yeah. And he's saying that you're, the world needs you. Yeah. England needs you. Yes. Essex needs you. Yeah. Everywhere needs you. The world needs you. The world needs you to fight for them. The world needs you to save them. The world needs you to work for them. The world needs you to help them. They're screaming. If you should rip open the roofs of all these fancy buildings right here, you'll see the abuse. You see the, 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 the drug abuse. Yeah. You see the promiscuity going on, the, the children being raped and groomed. You see all these things going on. And they're saying, I need you. Help me. Help me, Aaron Bukasa. I need you. Help me, Winston Clark. I need you. Right. Help me, Stellion. I need you. Help me. I need you. World War I consumed over 40 million people. Yeah. And I put before you that Satan is one more souls more than that. He's won more souls, more than 40 million. If people are willing to die for this, how much more us willing to die for the truth? How much more us willing to die for the, for the truth? Question is, what about the disciples? What, what are we willing to die for? What is stopping you from actually dying for the truth? You know, according to official records, five people died whilst building the Empire State Building. The Brooklyn Bridge had 30 deaths whilst trying to build it. More than 764 people died building the Hawk's Nest Railway Tunnel. 30,609 men died building the Panama Canal. Question is, are you willing to die for the truth? Are you willing to die to build a great church? Are you willing to die to build a great church? Point number three, preach this message. Preach this message. In verse 7, it says, As you go, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. The Bible is so simple. It says, don't have your own style. You know, sometimes we want our own style. The Bible here says, don't preach about emotions and all that. kind." It says, preach this message. Tell people about what you've seen. Tell people how your eyes have been opened. Preach this message. Preach the kingdom of God. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus spent 40 days preaching nothing but the kingdom of God. In Mark chapter 1, you see Jesus proclaiming the kingdom of God. He preached the kingdom of God from the beginning of his ministry to the end of his ministry. Why? Because it's all about the kingdom. Right. He could have chose to, to preach about so many different things. He could have chose to preach about marriage, about dating, about work, about all these different things, about politics. But he says that the, the, the need... For the, for the world, yes. is the kingdom. Yes. That God is shaking the world so that his, 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 his house, his church can be glorified. So that his glory can, can fill the church. The need is the kingdom. God is shaking the world. Preach this message, the kingdom of God. You know, it's so simple. In Acts chapter one, in verse three, it said he appeared over the period of 40 days. We, are, we all know it. And Jesus' mission was not the cross. That was, Jesus' mission was, yes, it was the cross actually, but his message was the kingdom of God. Jesus started his ministry preaching nothing but the kingdom of God. To build a great church is to preach a great message. You got to preach a great message to build a great church. You got to preach a great message to, to, to build a great church. The challenge is simple. We gotta go crazy. We actually need to be willing to die for this. We need to start preaching the word, not just teaching or suggesting. We gotta start asking people, hey, hey, bro, like when, when are you free to study the Bible? I set up studies on the spot. No, I don't wait for a couple of weeks. I set up studies on the spot. I'm like, when are you free? Already I've got five for next week. And that's not even good. It's not even a wow thing. It's not even wow. And that's, that's the issue. We say wow, it's not wow. It's not wow. My bare minimum is 18. My bare minimum. Bare minimum. Bare minimum. 
again, we need more workers. Yes. I, I, I want to put before you, if you feel touched by this message, disciple or not disciple, you feel like you need to repent and believe, come to me after. Nice. Come to me. If you're like, man, I want to be a worker, come to me right after. Yeah. Come to me right after. And we'll set up some crazy goals. Yes. But that's if your faith can handle it. Make sure you have some Jesus with you before you come. We're going to set up some crazy, crazy goals. Amen? Amen. In conclusion, you know, if you take the O from open your eyes, the T from the world needs you, the P from preach the word, you get an acronym that spells absolutely nothing. Why? Because to build a great church, you got to make yourself absolutely nothing. Amen. To preach the word, you got to make yourself absolutely nothing. And that is what we're going to do to build a church. And that is what we're going to do to glorify God. We're going to be absolutely nothing. I love you. And to God be all the glory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.